When Christopher Columbus passed by this part of Central America in 1502, he found a people bedecked in gold. Europeans later named this land Costa Rica, the rich coast. But their initial interest in these lands, unlike other parts of Central America, was fleeting. And until the turn of the 20th century, archaeologists ignored this part of the world too. And yet hidden here for centuries was a treasure trove of ancient art and a history of powerful, independent societies. This was a land of mysterious stone spheres with vast settlements spreading deep into tropical valleys and clinging to the slopes of forbidding mountains. And in this spectacular, vibrant landscape, amongst volcanoes and raging rivers, between oceans and continents, people created art and architecture which was astonishing in its complexity. Who were these people that Columbus saw draped head to toe in gold? Why were their elaborate settlements abandoned? And what did they leave behind? My name is Jago Cooper. I'm a specialist in the archaeology of the Americas. In this series, I will be exploring the rise and fall of forgotten civilizations. From the crystal clear seas of the Caribbean to the New World's most impressive pyramids over the smoking volcanoes of Costa Rica and deep underground in the caves of central Mexico. I'll travel in the footsteps of these peoples to reveal their secrets, unearth the astonishing cultures that flourished amongst some of the most dramatic landscapes in the world. And there are few landscapes more dramatic than Costa Rica where a thousand years ago, forgotten peoples battled against the elements to build a string of cities whose remains snake across this land. I want to find out the story of these people, find out why they rose, flourished and fell, and why that story has remained a mystery for centuries. Much of Costa Rica's ancient art and architecture was rediscovered during the 20th century. These discoveries helped us identify dozens of important settlements which had lain buried and forgotten for hundreds of years. Archaeologists grouped together southern Costa Rica and northern Panama under the term Chiriqui, a period roughly 800 to 1500 AD when a collection of powerful societies arise a period of religious, political and population growth that ends as suddenly as it began. It's a story that archaeologists are only just beginning to piece together. And to begin to understand the civilization of the Chiriqui era, we need to understand the landscape in which they lived. crushed between two oceans, with the Atlantic just down there and the Pacific behind. Just a hundred miles between them, these mountains rise up with these steep valleys and ridges. It's a hot, humid, mountainous terrain. The climate and landscape combine to make this a challenging environment. And Costa Rica is home to some of nature's most destructive forces. We're just coming over the Turrialba volcano. It's absolutely spectacular. You can see the smoke coming out of the crater because it's still very active, this volcano. You can understand why, for decades, historians believed no significant societies could have existed here. The landscape seemed too hostile, too fractured for major settlements to flourish. 
Instead, they focus their attention on what lay at either end of this narrow strip of land. To the north, you'll find the empires of the Maya, and to the south, the famous cultures of the Andes. But it's here in this narrow isthmus, hidden away in these valleys beneath the forest canopies, that we find a whole series of vibrant cities waiting to be explored. In the centuries before the Spanish conquest, a complex and connected series of settlements rose in this part of the world, from central Costa Rica right down to Panama. They were able to flourish because this terrain isn't as inhospitable as it appeared to the Europeans. There's plenty of water and volcanic ash creates a rich, fertile soil. But even once interest was piqued, finding these lost cities in this landscape can be something of a challenge. On average, nearly three meters of rain fall every year, obliterating wooden structures and organic material. And rain feeds this spectacular tropical vegetation, which just engulfs anything man-made within a few years. But deep in the agricultural heart of the country, Archaeologist Jeff Frost and his colleagues have spent the last two decades working at a site called Ribas. It's a site where we discover the first clues about how the Cherokee people lived and died. So, where should we start? Why don't we... So is this actually the site? This is the site. This oh, is right. it. So we're on So it's actually people living on it right now then? Yes. Uh, it looks like uh, they've they've utilized some of the uh, the stone circles here and built right upon them. So some of these walls you see here, the stones, those are actually parts of the site. The modern world may be encroaching on the ancient ruins of Rivas, but roughly 700 years after it was abandoned, the outline of a settlement is still visible. It consists mostly of stone circles ranging from about 10 meters in diameter to about 30 meters in diameter. This looks like, is that one there, like coming around here? Is this yeah, the exactly. We're just about to enter one here. You can see the other side of it here, mm -hmm. and it circles around this way. And on that side of it, we have one of the other architectural features, which is a series of steps coming up from a causeway. And these, they look almost like they're level platforms. Do you think these have been humanly leveled, or are they just taking advantage of like naturally flat ground? It looks like what was happening here was they, they were modifying the natural landscape. Right. So as you move up from one terrace to the next, these are natural terraces, mm -hmm. but what they've done is they've moved the rocks around into the positions that worked for them. And where are we standing here? What is this stone platform, do you think, telling us? This is one of probably about 30 stone circles in this site. This isn't one of the largest ones, but it's pretty close. This one's about 20 meters in diameter uh, and uh, is constructed of these uh, large uh, boulders that would have been moved into these positions. Uh, this would have originally been a, a covered space, most likely. Uh, so if we had been standing here in uh, AD 1000 or so, we would have been inside one of these large conical uh, structures. The evidence suggests that Ribas consisted largely of these structures, probably homes, for several hundred years. These families would have harvested maize and other crops for subsistence. But Jeff believes that at one particular moment in the Cherokee era, Ribas underwent a substantial change. A collection of homes was transformed into an important religious site, one which looks very different. They completely rebuilt the site, and that involved building the main monumental architecture on this central axis. The central axis consisted of plazas, these stone circles, steps, staircases, causeways, okay. um, all arranged sequentially in order to move people from one end of the site through the site and then eventually up to the Panteon de la Reina above. There were probably ceremonial specialists, uh, funerary specialists, uh, chiefs, priests, all who, of whom would have helped uh, control the activities and, and guide uh, participants. Through. This strikes me as really important. Ribas was completely rebuilt. Houses were replaced with grand plazas, and processional roads transformed Ribas from a village into a place of pilgrimage. 
The main road led people to a ridgetop cemetery called Pantheon de la Reina, the Pantheon of the Queen, which was once one of the biggest cemeteries in the region. And perhaps one answer to the mystery of this transformation can be found in the way the Chiriqui treated their dead. 1,000 years ago, the processions through Ribas would have ended at grave sites here. There's one right there. Where? Okay, right cool. There. So that thing there? There it is, yeah, that's the top of one. So how would these things have been around the grave then, do you think? From the best we can tell, they probably didn't mark individual graves, yep. but probably groups of graves. Right. Uh, and the way that the cemetery was organized, uh, deceased members of a single family would have been buried near uh, one another. Uh, so it does appear that they would have commemorated those individuals, and then uh, when they themselves died, they would have been buried uh, with, with their deceased family members. The bodies buried here are long gone, devoured by the tropical soil. And sadly, human hands have emptied the graves of valuable artifacts, vital clues to Cherokee life. You can see, if you look around here, all these marks in the soil are looted graves, or at least places where looters thought they were graves. Mm -hmm. So you can define the boundaries of these cemeteries pretty accurately uh, by just defining where the, these holes are. But we can guess what the looters were looking for. Gold. It's said that there were literally pounds and pounds of gold coming out of this site every day for months. Mm. Uh, so the looters would have systematically have gone through here, uh, trying to find the graves, digging them up, tunneling to the ones on either side of it, um, and then just taking out the, the, the gold. Heartbreaking though it is to lose so much of the treasure of Ribas, it's not surprising. Today, gold is the ultimate symbol of wealth and power. And because they placed so much gold in their ancestors' graves, perhaps it held a similar significance for the Cherokee people. They certainly used it as an emblem of authority among certain figures. Uh, we know that chiefs often had large amounts of gold. Other high-status individuals, elites, uh, would have worn lots of gold. Probably many commoners didn't have access to gold. So it was one of those ways of defining who was in charge uh, and who wasn't. The gold in these sites gives us some clues about the structure of Cherokee society, but there are so many questions to answer. What intrigues me most about this hidden world at Ribas is the sudden change that occurs here, the unexplained metamorphosis from a residential settlement to what appears to be a place of pilgrimage. It was a major change in how the Cherokees organized their settlement, which in turn would have changed the way they lived their lives. Walking around a site like this helps me to visualize the landscape, understand the lives of the people who are living here. There's a lot more going on in this part of the world than was thought for a long time. What's behind this rapid change at Rivas around 900 AD? And what's the motivation behind this big phase of construction? Is the answer connected to the large amounts of gold coming out of this cemetery at the top of the hill? The Museo Nacional in San Jose holds many of Costa Rica's pre-Columbian artefacts. I've come here to talk to Mirna Rojas, who manages the collections, to find out if these objects can help explain what happened at Ribas. There is, of course, a lot of gold in the stores here. But intriguingly, there are also artefacts from a different source, jade. These pieces of jewellery are made from jadeite, a form of the gemstone jade. Evidence suggests that before gold, jade was the precious material of choice for people in this region. These beautiful depictions of animals, birds and gods represented agriculture, vitality, the power of life itself. 
We haven't found a major source of jadeite in Costa Rica. But we do know it was mined in modern-day Guatemala, over 500 miles to the north. And we know the use of jadeite flourished in the Mayan Empire. This is a surprisingly important fact. If the Chiriqui were importing jade from the societies to the north, they were also forming other connections, probably trading not only goods, but also ideas and customs. So, whilst jade was being used, the Chiriqui were clearly in contact and exchanging influences with their northern neighbours. No, eso es definitivamente, eso es sí. definitivamente. Sin embargo, digamos, hay otros tipos de estilos, digamos, que se desarrollaron localmente, que es típico claro, sí. costarricense, exactamente. No podremos decir si es eh, intercambio, comercio, o digamos, como vino, eh, pero el asunto es que hay cierto tipo de relación, eso sí, que está documentado y es evidenciado por, digamos, la pieza en sí. E incluso, digamos, no solo hay intercambio de norte a sur, sino de sur a norte. But around 700 AD, something strange happened in Costa Rica. People stopped using jade and started using gold. The earthiness of the jade was replaced by a fine, delicate gold work, which I've seen many times before, not to the north, but to the south, over 600 miles away in the Andes. These little shamanic figurines hint at a developing religious culture different from that of the jade artifacts. They suggest that religious faith is bound up not just with the spiritual, but also with the physical well-being of the Chiriqui. Cierto tipo, digamos, de, de, de piezas no son deidades, más bien se han identificado como, digamos, figuras chamánicas por el tipo de parafernalia, digamos, y este individuo, digamos, que tiene el poder de conectar ambos mundos, uh -huh. ¿verdad? Es un conocimiento esotérico muy, muy importante para ellos y que también tiene que ver, digamos, con la cura de enfermedades y también con conocimiento sobre eh, cómo eh, su sistema, digamos, de, de producción, su, de, de las cosechas y todo ese asunto podía, digamos, mantenerse porque estas, estas cosechas obviamente son la base material que permitía el desarrollo de, este, de estas sociedades. We saw that in the graves above Rivas, gold was associated with power. And it's likely that gold was controlled and worn by the leaders of that society. So gold had a political role and a religious role, conferring both status in the community and religious connections. Entonces hay dos tipos de valores, digamos, de, para la misma sociedad, el valor como simbolismo de, de, de posición, de rango, y el otro, digamos, de conocimiento del chamán, de un individuo muy, muy importante dentro de su grupo. The transition from jade to gold is critical to understanding how the Chiriqui world changed. If the presence of jade signified influence from the north, then the growing importance of gold suggests that influences had now shifted. Which brings us back to our theme of connections. Because as the jade starts to disappear here, we know that to the north, the great Mayan city-states are in a state of decline. So is it the case that as the trade routes to the north are disrupted, the people here look to the south, where the dominant cultures valued gold? And if they did, what does that tell us about the lives of the people of the Chiriqui Golden Era? How would the change of attention from north to south change them? How did they live? And what did they believe in? In 1872, the forerunner of the American United Fruit Company built a railway line connecting coastal ports to the interior in order to get its banana crop to market. But during construction of the railway, one of the workers found some unusual objects hidden in the undergrowth. Purely by accident, the country's biggest banana exporter had stumbled upon a lost city even more important than Rivas. 
The clue was 30 beautiful pieces of gold. Today, the once lost settlement of Las Mercedes is managed by the Earth University and has been extensively studied by Ricardo Vasquez of the National Museum. So this is the cut coming through one of the buildings? This is exactly one of the buildings and this is the cut of a, of a tramway for bananas. And this is the expanse of the site looking out over the... Right, exactly. We are at the northernmost part of the architectural, architectural court. Yeah, if you look at the, um, the relief of the site, there's quite a lot of mounds. There's, like, there's one over there and Correct. there's one over here. Mm -hmm. So how, how far are these mounds spread out through the...? Through the... It's, it's in about 11 hectares. Wow. The architectural core is, is, uh, entails 11 hectares. That's massive. Las Mercedes offers us an opportunity to confirm the theory that a change in influences helped start the transformation at Rivas. And it does just that. It appears that, like Ribas, Las Mercedes underwent big changes shortly after the decline of the trade trade. The monumental architecture that we can see now started at about 900 AD and continues all the way for about three or four centuries. Only around 7.5% of the site is occupied by what we call roofed areas, I mean, features that qualify as households. In which case, when we start to think about this site, we're not just thinking about a big town full of residential complexes, we're thinking about a space which brings together people from the region at different times to meet, and what are they doing when they come here? One thing we know is that now we are uh, finding some gathering places, like uh, plazas, that are uh, integrated to the administrative complex. These plazas is really interesting because they are also paved. That means they've got uh, you know, quite a bit of people getting into the, into the plazas. Las Mercedes looks like it was an important settlement where people congregated to celebrate important events. And although looting has occurred here too, thousands of artifacts have been recovered from the site and the surrounding area. What type of artifacts were coming out? Well, gold, jade artifacts, uh, ceramic, ceramic artifacts, but uh, perhaps the more imp mo most impressive art type of artifacts are the, uh, the, the stonework, and then beautiful statues, uh, some of them human size. And in other words, the site was filled with uh, public sculptures. I mean, sculptures that were decorating the site. What do you think these artifacts then tell us about what type of site it is? If you imagine walking through this vegetation, you've got these big stone sculptures as you walk through. What does that say about the, the people who are living here, the type of site it was? Right. I mean, it, it looks like uh, they were trying to impress people, get, uh, the people who came into the site. And uh, not all, all, all with the uh, sculptures, but also with the architecture. And they, wanna, they wanted to create that uh, psychological uh, impression to the visitors. Next to the plazas, where hundreds of people would once have gathered, was the biggest house in the settlement. This was the house of the chief, and was at the heart of public life in Las Mercedes. This is uh, the area that we think is the very heart of the administrative center. That area over there used to be where the uh, main mound was placed. And then the, the whole thing relates to some observations done by the Spaniards, where the Spaniards say that the, the house of the chief was a very high house, the main house, mm -hmm. and also a, and it, that was his office, was his administrative quarters. And right beside it, there was another similar house that was for his family, where his sons, daughter, wives were we're living. Even centuries after it was abandoned, you can still feel that this was the center of Las Mercedes. Many of the grandest statues were found scattered around here. And there are tantalizingly ambiguous hints at just how dramatic a spot this would have been. There's a depression in here and this nice like circular, semicircular wall running around. What, what do you think the role of this depression in front of that man would have been? Uh-huh. We, we started with two hypotheses. The first one was a, a, a sunken plaza mm -hmm. that was paved, and that's why it's so, it's so wet. 
And the second one is that it was a reflecting pool. Now we are leaning more towards the second hypothesis that it was a reflecting pool because all around the area is a pavement that slopes down into the plaza. That means that it was collecting water, rainwater, and bringing it to the plaza. And, and then this is really interesting it will, because it will reflect what it was the, the main house in a way. But visually, it would have been very dominating. If you have this big house structure on top of this big mound and you're walking and approaching it through a reflecting pool, the whole thing, the whole vista would have been quite dramatic. To me, it's, it's, it's really clear that the, the site was dominated by the political figure. I'm getting a sense of how these settlements were organized. It's not just the gold or the statues, it's the way the people have manipulated the landscape itself, creating a reflecting pool outside the chief's house to emphasize the importance of the dwelling and of the individual inside. The intention was to leave no one in any doubt. The chief was at the center of political power here, and that implies religious power too. But something else strikes me. The plazas suggest Las Mercedes was designed to be seen, to be visited by people from the surrounding valleys and further afield. This meant people came here to visit. And at the edge of the site, Ricardo and his team have discovered how these visitors were drawn in. So underneath here is the road then? Yes. Nice. This is the very end of, the, of the, one of the two roads leading to Las Mercedes. And how long does the road go? If Mercedes is, how far down the road is Mercedes? It's uh, 1,700 meters from here exactly, according right. to the map. This seemingly random jumble of boulders was once a road seven meters wide, meticulously constructed using thousands of stones extracted from nearby rivers. They're almost like procession ways between the sites. Correct. So is that when you get close to a site, you start to walk along it and sort of have a sense of drama and arrival. That's exactly what we think they are. That's the function they, they, they had. Yeah. But also, they are just formalized entrances into the sites. Yeah. They were for controlling the, uh, the access to the site. These roads were hacked out of the forest across this region. They would have been used to connect settlements which otherwise would have been cut off from one another by the tropical landscape. And a grand causeway like this, emerging from the forest as people approached Las Mercedes, signifies just how important a site it was. The implications of this road are profound because it requires hard labour, labour that needs to be controlled and coordinated by someone, a political hierarchy. And the purpose of these roads are to connect both practically and ideologically communities together, which suggests trade, interaction, a linked network of sites, sites similar or perhaps larger than Las Mercedes, hidden away somewhere in these valleys. But to find those other communities in this landscape is difficult and arduous. Sometimes a river works better than a road. It's coming to remote valleys like this, that you remember just how extreme this part of the world can be. It's a land full of environmental hazards, earthquakes, volcanoes, floods, landslides. But it's that ability to control the environment, harness its power, that takes great skill. And it's key to understanding how the cities emerge here. The natural world played a central role in pre-Columbian life. In order to flourish, cities had to be built in harmony with the landscape, 
hugging the contours of the hills and guarding against the destructive power of fire and water. Water. Water is key to understanding the landscapes here in Costa Rica. It cascades down the steep volcanic slopes and funnels through raging rivers like this one. It's what makes the landscape so lush and provides so much food. But it's also dangerous. Floods are common and they can wash away villages and settlements in an instant. But as well as providing fertile territory, the rivers serve another purpose. River networks connect people and so were critical to trade and communication for the Chiriqui. It's no coincidence that many settlements were built where rivers met. And here, between two rivers and on the slopes of an active volcano, we find our largest settlement yet. It is the greatest example of these people's ability to harness their tough, natural environment. This is Guayabo de Torrialba, a site which once housed several thousand inhabitants and likely dominated life in these lush valleys a thousand years ago. Archaeologists have uncovered only a portion of this site. Much of it still lies under the forest. But what we can see is a highly developed, highly organized and powerful settlement which thrived for hundreds of years. Since controlled excavations began here in the 1960s, archaeologists have uncovered dozens of mounds. Just like the stone circles of Ribas, these would have been the foundations of large homes. And as at Ribas and Las Mercedes, there's more than homes. In this case, wide plazas, roads and even functioning aqueducts have been discovered. Guayabo is the clearest example of just how impressive settlements in Costa Rica had become in the centuries before Europeans arrived. Mauricio Murillo has studied and written about Guayabo's history. He believes that here again, the most significant architecture was completed in a short burst at the end of the first millennium. The place, as we see today, was constructed alrededor del 900 al 1100 después de Cristo. Siguió siendo ocupado, parece ser que de manera continua, hasta quizás poco antes de la conquista española. There's a genius to this architecture. Guayabo lies over a thousand meters above sea level on the slopes of the Torrialba volcano. It is drenched by three meters of rain every year. And yet the people who built it were able to use this unpromising natural environment to their advantage. La forma natural de la tierra es bastante quebrada. Es, es, eh, difícilmente se encuentran zonas planas eh, en todo este lugar. Y además, eh, debido a lo lluvioso que es este lugar, La construcción de los basamentos de las casas, que son estos montículos donde estamos actualmente, eh, ayudan a que las casas no se inunden. As well as guarding against flooding, the people who built Guayabo harnessed the natural flow of water through the landscape. As the clouds broke on the volcano above, rainwater was captured by a series of aqueducts and then directed into communal tanks for drinking, bathing and ritual purposes. Everything in Guayabo is on a bigger scale compared to what I have seen so far, but the similarities are clear. This road stretches deep into the forest, just like at Las Mercedes. You can see how it controlled access to the site, funneling people into the center. A central highway like the one at Arribas, which led religious processions up to the Pantelon de la Arena. And the construction of such a complex settlement suggests a significant level of political control. Eh, la coordinación para, para la construcción debió haber sido liderada por ciertas personas eh, con cierto rango, eh, diferentes al, 
resto de la comunidad. Por lo tanto, estaríamos probablemente hablando del de, de surgimiento de una sociedad casical. A chief would have been the most important political figure in the community, standing at the top of an elite group of citizens and commanding the loyalty and labor of people for miles around. Posiblemente aquí tenemos elementos de, de control, de, de control tanto de índole político como religioso, por parte de una élite que controlaba quizás no solamente lo que estaba ocurriendo acá, sino lo que estaba ocurriendo alrededor. Cuánto o qué tan lejos eh, fue ese control, aún no lo sabemos, pero posiblemente eh, si vemos la extensión de las calzadas eh, precolombinas, de los caminos, eh, posiblemente estamos hablando de algunas eh, decenas de kilómetros alrededor. But it wasn't just political control that the chief commanded. We can see a design that suggests the chief controlled nature itself, from the fiery volcano above to the running water below. In the middle of this plaza is this striking stone-built mound. This would have been the residence of the chief, and on top would have been a wooden structure with a conical thatched roof. What I really like about the mound is that it makes the most of the landscape. The entrance procession would have led up here and seen this chief's house framed by the Torrealba volcano behind. It really gives a sense of power and dominance of the landscape to the chief within. And like at Las Mercedes, water appears to have been funneled into these shallow pools in front of this residence. It would have been an awesome sight for any visitor to Guayabo. The wide road led them directly to this spot. In front of them, the chief's house reflected in a large pool of water. Behind the house, the fiery volcano, the most potent force in the natural world. Human construction and the natural world combined to emphasize the power of the chief and their allies. At all three sites I've visited, there has been a rapid transformation at around the time jade ran out and gold started to dominate. We can't say that gold alone explains the changes, but I'm convinced it is part of the answer. It makes me wonder what other developments are associated with gold. All of the sites that I've visited in Costa Rica so far seem to have undergone significant change at around the same time, at the end of the first millennium AD. And this usually involved a period of expansion and growth. Politically, it's a picture of cities being controlled by chiefs, and religion always plays a key part at each site. This period of dramatic growth always seems to be associated with the arrival of gold. And if that's the case, then the next question has to be, where did this gold come from? For centuries, prospectors have headed to southern Costa Rica to pan for gold in the rivers which empty into the Pacific Ocean. More than 90% of the gold in San Jose's museums comes from that part of the country. And that's where I'm heading now. Occasionally, gold nuggets as big as eggs have been washed out of the rivers and streams which crisscrossed southern Costa Rica, making this area a great source of gold and making it an important bridge between Costa Rica and the cultures to the south. Archaeologists believe people from the south, who already worshipped gold, sailed up the Pacific coast in search of new sources and to trade with the people here. And one of the most important trading posts was at the mouth of the Dickis Delta, on the Isla del Caño. This island was a trading post for gold. But that culture of gold didn't spontaneously emerge here. It developed with influences from further afield, almost certainly from down that coast, where the great gold-working cultures of South America were emerging. Just as jade is associated with connections to the north, 
So gold signifies a connection with the South. Gold was central to the peoples of the Andes. To them, it was much more than a simple metal. Gold objects were associated with political power and spiritual authority. So in societies where control over gold was limited to a select few, these individuals wielded huge power over the community. Is this what happened here, the emergence of powerful chiefs who ruled thanks to their control of gold? Chiefs who could command large-scale building projects and the expansion of settlements. On this island, where the two worlds met, the gold is long gone. But there are hints that an important society did once exist here. These are some of the stone spheres of the Dickies Delta. Nearly 300 of them have been found. And production peaked during the Chiriki era. These spheres aren't created on a whim. They're found throughout the region. What role do they play in the lives of the people who live here? They must mean something. The question is what? There are many outlandish theories about them. That they are aligned with Stonehenge, with Easter Island, even that they were part of the lost city of Atlantis. all of which I can safely say are nonsense. But whatever their purpose, the effort that went into their creation is remarkable. This has been carved from an igneous rock where the outcrops are on the mainland, transported over 12 miles out to this island. It says something about how significant these pieces of monumental architecture are to the society, that they're being transported across the landscape and placed in places like this. Today, these spheres are everywhere in southern Costa Rica. In parks, in schools, even in people's gardens. They have become a national symbol. And once again, we have the humble banana to thank for inadvertently uncovering Costa Rica's past. We've seen how the people here try to live in harmony with the landscape, building roads, settlements. But not all people who have come here have been so careful. Some, like the United Fruit Company, have radically altered the landscape. In the 1930s, they came here and took down the large rainforest that covered southern Costa Rica and put in huge banana plantations instead. But during the process of the construction of those plantations, they discovered hundreds of stone spheres that had lain hidden for over 400 years. The National Museum's Francisco Corrales is in charge of excavating one of these old banana plantations. Finca Seis is the center of the sphere making culture in Costa Rica. Las hemos encontrado en alineamientos en zonas abiertas. Se han encontrado al frente de residencias importantes y también se han encontrado como parte de, de actividades donde se quebraban objetos intencionalmente, esculturas e incluso esferas, eh, tal vez como parte de algún rito eh, simbólico o religioso, una ceremonia de terminación o, o una ruptura simbólica de un elemento. Entonces estamos viendo que el uso era bastante variado eh, y por, por mucho tiempo y en una región bastante amplia. The spheres were created using simple hammers. These would be used to batter and chip away at massive rocks until they were almost perfectly spherical. Some have a smooth, polished finish, achieved by rubbing sand across the surface. Lo que hemos visto es que el tamaño y el acabado tiene mucha relación también con la importancia del sitio. Mientras más importante es el sitio, la esfera tiende a ser más grande y mejor acabada. ¿Y piensas que la esfera es un elemento de, de identidad? Indudablemente. Este grupo toma este elemento como su elemento de identidad, el elemento distintivo. Eh, igual que otras sociedades se distinguen por, por ejemplo, las grandes cabezas de los Olmecas o elementos de piramidales, esta sociedad optó por este, por este elemento. 
Centuries of rain and flooding have covered this site in deep layers of sediment, leaving much of what was once here barely visible today. But Francisco and his colleagues believe there is much more to be discovered beneath these banana plants. Entonces, ¿qué es el tamaño de este sitio? Este, este lugar forma parte de un asentamiento muy extenso que podía llegar hasta unas 200 hectáreas de, de extensión con diferentes focos en, en, en ciertos puntos donde encontramos eh, una especie de centros de poder con estructuras elevadas que eran las bases de grandes viviendas donde vivían los principales del lugar. Y en las zonas abiertas de esos asentamientos se colocaban alineamientos de esferas de piedra de diferente tamaño eh, para señalar la importancia del lugar pero también la importancia de los líderes. This site could be even bigger than Guayabo, a huge settlement which may well have dominated this landscape 1,000 years ago. And although the spheres are unique to the south, the society that created them sounds similar to the settlements I've visited further north. Societies in which rank was important in which political and religious power were concentrated in the hands of a few significant individuals. So, there is a stratification social that is very propia del nivel de organization de tipo casical, donde hay un leader, hay que es el cacique o jefe, hay un leader religioso que se le denomina también chamán. Eh, sí. Uno puede imaginar al cacique recubierto de oro, uh -huh. eh, saliendo aquí con un atuendo, hay música, sí. hay chicha, sí. hay verdad, de todos esos sonidos, y están las esferas. Y las actividades se realizan aquí, en un espacio delimitado por estas esferas que transmite un elemento de poder. Me gusta porque tiene una comparación con Guayabo, ¿no? Porque ellos tienen sus calzadas que están grandes y que vienen aquí, tienen otra forma de, de, de gran... Exactamente. Es, es, son sociedades con un nivel eh, de organización similar, pero la configuración particular es diferente. Entonces, eh, pero, pero, pero el fin es el mismo, ¿verdad? Eh, aquí vive gente poderosa, y usted tiene que mostrar su subordinación al momento de entrar y esos son los ejemplos materiales para mostrar el poder que ellos tienen. The spheres are mainly found in southern Costa Rica. They aren't found in Rivas, Guayaba or Las Mercedes. This shows that these settlements were independent of one another, each with its own distinct culture. And yet the similarities are clear. Here, as further north, the chief and their allies used impressive architecture, roads and statues to emphasize their power. And at Thinkerseis, you can get an idea of just how powerful the local chief was when you consider the effort required to build this city of spheres. It's a two-hour horse ride deep into the Talamanca Mountains to the spot where archaeologists now believe the spheres began their life. This sphere was not meant to remain here. It was abandoned, unfinished. It was hewn out of one of the massive boulders which cover this forest, making this place a quarry. And if this is the quarry, then moving these spheres into place must have been a truly enormous task. La fuente de materia prima queda a una distancia a veces bastante lejana del destino final. De hecho, la mayor cantidad de las esferas está en la zona baja, en la planicie aluvial, a una distancia que estará, de, como le digo, de 4 a 10 kilómetros de acá. In between here and the valley below are rivers, ravines and steep slopes covered in dense vegetation. So moving spheres like this, many weighing several tons, down to the valley can only have been achieved by a highly organized society. Hay que pensar en una sociedad que ya tenía un sistema de organización casical y por lo tanto había un mandato, una, un, mecanismos coercitivos para, ya fuera por métodos de, religiosos o, o por fuerza, que la gente lo hiciera. Eh, hay que pensar en la preparación del, del camino previamente y el uso tal vez de troncos, eh, de, de lianas, de cuerdas para eh, arrastrar la esfera a través del paisaje. 
Pero eh, una buena imagen es cuando se hace una, una canoa también, que se corta un árbol y se prepara para llevar al río. Y por supuesto había personas asistiendo con la alimentación, dando ánimo, eh, con agua, eh, hasta que se llegaba al lugar. This has profound implications for our understanding of the way of life of indigenous peoples in Costa Rica. The spheres demonstrated power. Firstly, the power over nature to make them. And secondly, the power required to physically move them across the landscape. And all of this revolves around the power of the chief, who was able to command this incredible production and who would have had the biggest and most impressive spheres placed outside their house. Looking at this sphere, I can't help but see a complex, inventive and significant society behind it. Just like at Rivas, Guayabo and Las Mercedes, there's an explosion of building and art around the same time, when gold becomes the dominant material in the region. And the way that people live becomes more hierarchical, centered on rank, status and power. But when the Europeans arrive, they don't find a harmonious and prosperous people. They find a world at war. In the 16th century, Spanish accounts of brutal indigenous warfare in this part of the world were common. One account describes roads piled high with hundreds of severed human heads. And that is one of the great unsolved questions of the Chiriqui era in Costa Rica. What happened? What caused this warfare? And why, when the Spanish arrived at the start of the 16th century, did they find so many of these settlements in decline or abandoned altogether? One clue could lie deep in the southern Costa Rican mountains. After the arrival of the Spanish, we know that the indigenous people retreated here to the remote Talamanca Mountains next to the modern-day border with Panama. Whilst we can't identify the direct descendants of the people of the Chiriqui era, we know that these indigenous populations have managed to hold on to their beliefs, customs and practices for hundreds of years. The people who live here today are known as the Bri Bri. 15,000 live in scattered communities along the Panamanian border. For many years, they've existed on the fringes, a reminder of Costa Rica's pre Columbian past, but not quite part of its modern story. Mayor Leandro is a local Bribri community leader. Like a shaman of old, he is responsible for the health of the people who live here. And today he has invited me into his surgery. So the baby is seven months old, um, called Ashley. And uh, yeah, she's the mother's brought her here. She's been poorly. And now Mayor Leandro is uh, starting to prepare some of the plants um, to try and improve and solve the problem. So Mayor Leandro is, uh, is toasting these leaves and then brushing them over Asley, the little baby. I don't understand exactly how this treatment is helping little Asley. But Leandro's attitude to the causes of illness is one that has existed amongst the Bribri for hundreds of years.
So there's an interesting concept about where these illnesses come from. They describe as being strangers that come from far away, and when they visit the body, they bring with them the sickness and the vomiting. And so a big part of this ceremony is about uh, purification, to get rid of that stranger uh, and send them far away from the village. If people believe disease is brought to the village from outside, then two things can occur. Either you can break off contact with your neighbours, sending your community into isolation and decline. Or you retaliate against the attack. So could this have been the cause of conflict the Spanish saw? Leandro blames the Spanish for bringing disease and discord to this world. There is another possibility that the very success of the Chiriki era sowed the seeds of its own downfall. As the people became more adept at mastering their tropical environment, populations rose and resources, once bountiful, became scarce, leading to conflict. We don't have enough information to say for sure. But whether we blame competition for resources or disease, we can say one thing for certain. Connections had nourished trade and ideas and sustained growth. When the connections fractured, these societies fell. So by the time the Spanish fought their way in land, the great settlements were already in decline or had been abandoned. All that was left was their gold. The people here had thrived by reaching out to the communities in the north and to the south, but those links are broken. For the first time, the Cherokee people and their neighbours become isolated. With isolation comes insecurity, and with insecurity comes conflict. Four centuries of rain and the suffocating spread of tropical vegetation obscured the legacy of the Cherokee era. Only now are there substantial achievements coming back into view. The cities of this era were controlled by chiefs who built powerful networks far beyond these valleys. These people shared ideas and traded peaceably with one another for hundreds of years. Gold was critical to growth and change. And we have started to uncover some of the spectacular remains of their vibrant societies. We know much more than we did just a few decades ago about this incredible land that was once relatively unexplored archaeologically. Now we know the people of the Cherokee era, how they thrived through their connections between empires, between oceans, how they harnessed the power of one of the wildest and most challenging environments in the world, and how they produced some of the most unusual, beautiful and impressive art and engineering feats in the Americas.